when you're a band from the 90s and it's 2018 or 19, most of those people don't really care. They just want to hear this old music. And the Ghost Cult Magazine podcast is honored to welcome in Christopher Hall of Stabbing Westward. How are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. How are you? I am fantastic. Uh, this is uh, it's going to be a treat chatting with you. I'm super pumped. Lots of big news in the Stabbing Westward world. Your PR team has been doing a marvelous job. I'm going to start in a place that's probably weird, but I feel like this is the culmination of, I, I'm, I'm sure it wasn't necessarily sketched out this way, but I'm, I feel like this is the culmination of the entire arc of the reunion since 2016. Like I was hoping there would be new music. I was hoping you guys would put out some new stuff. You had intimated it, said it in a couple of shows. We may be working on some live stuff. Who knows? Would you want to hear any? <sighs> yes. So I'm really glad. I'm really glad to talk to you like right at the start of this process for you. Most of the time it shows when I would say that it would be completely facetious. I would say, who wants to hear a new song? And everyone would cheer. And then we'd play, what do I have to do? Or save yourself or something. <laughs> Because, you know, I know. I, actually, when, when we first started the reunion thing, um, the very first show we did was um, this Cold Waves Festival pre-show party um, in Chicago. Cold Waves is a, a, an industrial music festival in Chicago that um, raises awareness and funds for uh, suicide prevention hotlines and, and a charity of that nature. And... Um, they had asked us to, um, the Dreaming, my other band with Walter, had played a show at the Double Door in Chicago. And um, we had Mark, who was a guitar player on Darkest Days, get up on stage and play six or seven stabbing songs in a row during that show because we were in Chicago. And um, people loved it. It was really cool. Um, and we thought, well, that was fun. But we didn't really think about putting stabbing back together. Um, and then Cold Waves called and asked us if we would do the same thing, but as Stabbing Westward, just a whole set of Stabbing Westward. And oh, by the way, can you put a new song on the compilation CD that we put out every year and sell for, to raise proceeds um, for this charity? And we're like, huh, okay. So we had a song that we had written, um, I can't remember. It was either Plastic Jesus, which was a song on our first EP, or we did a song called Home and You, which was um, a song that we had written after the self-titled album, but when we were trying to do a, a fifth album before we broke up. And so we put, I can't remember which one, because uh, we did one we did one for each compilation. One year we did the pre-show party and one year we had one. When we, when we did Home and You, oh, okay, yeah, that's it. So Home and You we did on the second, Time we played Cold Waves Festival when we headlined the Metro. And I asked the crowd, do you guys want to hear a new song? We just recorded this song for the Cold Waves compilation. We'd love to play it for you live. And everyone cheered and went crazy. And then we started playing the song. And the reaction was just kind of glazed over looks. And then people quickly looked down at their phones and started catching up on their Facebook and their Twitter and their Instagram and texting other people, I'll meet you at the bar you know, stuff like that, because they didn't know the song. They, you know, they'd come to hear all the songs that they knew, and we're playing this brand new song, and maybe 10% of the crowd had any interest in actually hearing it, and the other 90% lost interest. And at that point, and we worked really hard to record the song and learn it and practice it. You know, we all lived in different cities at that point, so the idea of rehearsing was really hard and whatnot. Um, and we put a lot of work into it, and then we looked out in the audience, and there was just like, the, you know, the top of everyone's head while they're looking down at their phone, and that that kind of took the, 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 the wind out of my sails as far as writing new music, because I realized as much as I thrive on writing new music and I have a lot to say when you're a band from the nineties and it's 2018 or 19, most of those people don't really care. They just want to hear this old music. And so I just kind of went with that. That was kind of my theory. I was like, you know, if we write another album, let's release it as the Dreaming, and we'll have the Dreaming be our outlet for new music. And Stabbing Westwood can be a heritage band that just, you know, plays shows for people that want to hear the old music. Um, and then that got kind of kind of boring. We're we you know we did a year of shows 
playing the Darkest Days album. And the whole time we're still writing songs um, and we've got all this new music and I'm super excited about it, but I'm still struggling with, does anybody want to hear it? Does anyone even care? And then um, there just came a point where I just stopped caring about that. I was like, you know what? I, I need to do new music. I need to sing something new because I can't keep singing these same 20 year old songs over and over and over again without putting something new in to make it exciting for us. I felt like we sort of took the power back because when we were younger, when we were doing Ungod, we didn't care if anyone, no one had ever heard it before because it, we never had any music out before. So every night was the hard work of winning over a crowd with music they'd never heard before because we're generally opening for Depression Road or Killing Joke or something like that. And so it was always hard work. And it's like, wow, I've gotten lazy. I just want to stand up here and say, what do I have to do and save yourself and have people sing along and cheer. And, you know, let's get back to the hard work of being a young band releasing new music and, and make these people want to hear the songs. You know, work hard, play them so well that they can't ignore you, even though the world is so distracted by social media and whatnot. Um, and yeah, so that's been sort of the attitude. It's like put all your energy in writing the best music we can right now. Don't worry about who's going to hear it. Don't worry about any of that stuff. Just make it the best we can make it and then go out and play it and see how it goes. That's nice. a long well, answer. Wow. That's a good, it's a good answer though. I'll tell you what though. Thank you for sharing. I don't think a lot of people would be very candid like that. So again, already not disappointed by this chat. Um, I think it's, it is weird. We live in a strange time where on one hand fans love nostalgia and you guys have massive hits and, beloved records and then also as an artist right some you you can see that some people out there are just like well i'm i'm just mailing it in i don't care anymore but i've seen i've seen the shows and you guys give everything every night i've seen several go rounds of the reunion tour over multiple years so I, yeah you know, no I think, we, we 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 love playing the shows i'm not saying i'm oh, like radiohead sick of playing creep or anything like that no i still love <laughs> playing all these songs in fact some of the songs that that I didn't enjoy playing as much when we were younger for various ego and, you know, inner band politics reasons and stuff like that. I've really, I've really grown to like enjoy playing. I've seen the, the, the greatness in the songs and, and I see fans reactions to songs and I'm like, okay, it doesn't really matter 20 years ago who wrote this or who was being mean to who at the time it was being written. This is a cool song and people like it and I enjoy singing it. I, I, recognize it as a cool song now and so i've actually found sort of a, a new joy in singing a lot of the material um it would just be fun to mix it up every once in a while nice and when you guys were writing dead and gone did you know that you were already pushing toward a full length or was yeah that, no those were just three songs out of ten that we'd already written yeah the, the record was already written at that point the original plan was for us to self-release three eps um, of material that we already had written and then to put them all on one album and release it as an album. And the, the mentality was um, Walter's still in the music industry. He's a, he runs a radio station in Seattle now and he ran the alternative station in Chicago for a long time. Um, and he said that, you know, oh, the album format is dead. You know, people's attention span is so short that they want a single or 10 singles or worst case scenario, two or three EPs, and then you can lump it all together for collectors to have on one album, but you need to keep constantly releasing stuff in order to stay uh, relevant, I think was the word he used. And while I agree with that in theory, and I agree with that if you're a young up and coming band trying to keep 24 year olds listening to you over the course of three months, um, I get it. But when you're a band that's already had success and your fans are all over 35 and have a longer attention span and like listening to, you know, I, I mean, I just, I know myself, I'm not a millennial. I'm not a kid who, who jumps around Spotify constantly fast forwarding or, you know, it's like, I know what I want to hear. I'll listen to the whole thing. I can listen to Gary Newman's Savage record all the way beginning to end, no problem and let it go on repeat. Um, there's yeah so it's for me it's a different mentality and I think that when you think of music in terms of music listeners now who are listening to new bands on the radio now it's a different mindset than uh, thinking about our specific bands and what they're looking for and I, I think that they would like an album where they can 
listen to the whole thing as a whole. All the songs are about a similar place in time and theme. And I think that there's something beautiful about the format of, a, of an album telling a whole story. I can hear my child screaming like a lunatic above me. Well, like father, like son. Um, <laughs> Let's hear that. Um, you know, he's practicing for his future. Yeah, I and mean, that's a really great answer. And, you know, of course, you know, I, I do think it's important for, you know, like, as I was alluding to, I think, you know, it's good. I, I like that you recognize that you weren't fulfilled and you wanted to do this as much for yourself. You know, I think, you know, I, believe me, as a fan and a journalist, I, I'm psyched that new music is more new music is coming but i like that you're still on a creative journey yourself i was still a big fan of the dreaming and i'm sure you have other stuff there you may go back to someday but you know and i know you actually also did i think you've done a couple of performances where it was just you and walter doing just kind of industrial stuff just not under a moniker you know can you hang on just one second i see to hear sure. what's going on oh, okay sorry he uh he pooped and he was sitting there screaming done waiting for someone to come wipe his butt. And I assumed his mom was up there, but she's out. We just built a, a she shed for her in the backyard for her office. And she was out there doing something. And so uh, I, he was screaming on the toilet, waiting for his butt to get wiped. I'm glad I took my headphones off. <laughs> okay. So you were Mother saying. Heard. Keeping it real. About the dream. Okay. Yeah, I was saying, I, pre I appreciate that. Uh, creatively, you felt you wanted to, you know, there's more for you to say understanding westward i love the dreaming stuff also and i am definitely it's definitely not you know two different flavors so i think it's cool that you recognize that yourself that you you know there was more to say um yeah uh i never stopped writing <laughs> i actually started writing more when stabbing westward broke up because i felt like i had been sort of liberated from some shackles that had been imposed on me in stabbing westward we had so many writers in the band that um I didn't get to write nearly as much as I wanted to. I was in, in Stabbing, I was uh, on the first record, I was super active writing with Stuart. But then after Andy joined the band, he started writing. He had a ton of music that he had written before Stabbing Westward that we used. And um, he, he wrote all the time, constantly pumping out songs. Even, even nowadays, he like works for a, he runs a, a company that pumps out the music that goes in the, you know, the, the breaks in TV shows, like home improvement shows and garage shows and stuff. He does all the little riffs that happen when they start up the chainsaw or whatever. Um, so he, he was constantly writing and then Walter was constantly writing. So my job is always to fill in the blanks with vocals and lyrics and stuff like that. But I had tons of songs that I wanted to, to write as well, but there's just never any space. So each record I would get one or two songs that I'd sort of toss on the record, like a Y or a You Complete Me or um, Sleep, stuff like that. And um, so when, when the dreaming happened, I, I felt like, oh my gosh, I can just go crazy writing. And now that it's just me and Walter, it's, it's pretty cool because we're splitting the, hi buddy. Um, yeah, so, so the, the dreaming was a cool outlet, but it was never quite exactly what I wanted it to be. Um, and then when Walter joined the band, I'm like, well, this feels like coming home. But then I realized, well, that's not really the journey either. That this is stabbing westward, so we should probably just call it what it is. Walter's writing music, and I'm writing vocals like the old days. And it's cool that you're in touch with Andy. Uh, I'm, it's that's amazing that he's uh, still. I'm not very, in touch I'm with not... Andy. <laughs> oh, okay, sorry. I'm not yeah, surprised. No, no, I'm a, yeah, no, he's 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 still writing like a crazy person. Yeah, we asked him if he wanted to do this, and he's super busy with his business. And then I don't think that he's really sat behind a drum kit for. A long time yeah neither him or jim really showed any interest in, in getting mm -hmm. in a van and driving around the tour. right right well i figured as long as it's always you and walter it's always stabbing you know i think that yeah everybody it, accepts that I, I i would have to say that that for it to truly be stabbing andy andy was huge in stabbing westward his his influence and his input uh after after uh um and God was immense. Um, so I, I, I know that Walter and I started the band and, and we'll, we'll always be sort of the core of the band, but I, I do have to acknowledge Andy as being a major part of, especially now that we have a, we're putting a whole album together without him. Um, I'm realizing just how often I sort of go back to the same vocal stylings and, and like just, we, we just have our way of doing things. And when you had Andy writing music as well, it just brought in one more flavor um that was like i would never write 
songs or melodies the way he did. So he just brought in this like totally different flavor that just added a richness to the album so that the 10 songs didn't start to sound kind of all similar, the same sort of the Nickelback syndrome. Um, and <laughs> Andy definitely added a, a great richness to the band that, that now that we're 10 songs into an album, I'm like, yeah, I could use three or four of those just to add some variety. I feel, I feel like I need, I, need, um, I need to sit down after hearing Nickelback syndrome. But um, <laughs> well, that's that, it's that thing where you can stack all the Nickelback songs on top right. of each other and they all line up. Yeah, right. Pretty much. Well, yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm super pumped for you know. Congrats on the record deal. First of all, that's a really cool label uh, to be on uh, COP International. They have a lot of cool bands. Like all your brethren and sister type bands are on mm-hmm. that label, and uh, very cool company. And also, sort of a little back to being kind of a a little you know, sort of a major style label, but a DIY personality, which I think right. is what, probably the I best mean, way to go in this era. We were so excited. And when I spoke to Christian on the phone, his enthusiasm for just music and just the whole, everything was just so awesome. And it's it's truly what I was I was missing because we had just finished doing the Dead and Gone EP. It's, it's sold all right. I mean, it sold literally every copy as fast as I could order them. And I didn't know how many, Walter had told me, oh, no one's going to buy a CD. CDs are dead. But we sold 2,500 in like a week. And then I ordered more and those sold out before I could get them ordered and I should have made a bigger order. And then I was mailing them out of my office. Like I had envelopes and a printer, a stamp printer and copying and pasting and doing this whole process. And I spent a good like eight to 10 hours a day in my office mailing CDs to people all over the world. And I'm like, yeah, by that point, my enthusiasm for doing a second EP was gone. Walter's like, I think it went really well. I'm like, yeah, because you didn't have to do any of the actual physical work. You know, you just watched the numbers come in on PayPal and celebrated how many we sold, but you didn't have to actually put them in an envelope and mail them. And it's like the paper cuts and this, you know, it was like, it was, it was a, a full-time job. I was like, I need an intern to do this. And so when I talked to Christian, and he was so enthusiastic. I'm like, this is this is what I I need to be enthusiastic about music, not lose my my enthusiasm for music because I'm working in a cubicle, like <laughs> mailing out CDs. That was a, a bit of a drain. But yeah, we we pretty much entered into an amazing partnership with them, and um, it's like unlike a deal I've ever seen before. Where we're really just partners. It's like last night Christian and I were talking on the phone. I sent him a song, or we're talking online. I sent him a song, and he's like. What do you think about maybe putting a harmony in the chorus? So at one o'clock in the morning, I was humming a harmony into a microphone and then I sent it to him this morning. Oh, what do you think? So, I mean, that's a cool hands-on sort of approach that I, I respect a lot. Nice. And it's good to have that give and take and that trust with a, with for a partner. Sure, for because, sure. You know, it's hard. <laughs> the business yeah. is hard. It's, no. it's, 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 it's super hard. Yeah. Maybe never harder than right now, considering the pandemic and everything. But, um, you know. Uh, it, it, it was pretty hard back in the day. For sure. Um, but yeah, man, uh, super pumped. And then Fryer, right? So that's the other ingredient that we have to talk about is Fryer. Yeah, that's the, mis- the mystery ingredient. <laughs> uh, right. Uh, like the secret, the, the 12, the 13 spices, wherever it is. Uh, yeah. So, you know, that, you know, he, he, he himself, I read the quote from him that like, oh, you know, some of my finest work ever was those first few records with, with stabbing. So I love seeing that. And I'm sure, you know, it's got to feel a boost of confidence to come back and, re, you know, reconnect and collaborate with John. It's, it's, it's two things at the same time. I was, I was super stoked at the idea of working with John again, because John sort of helped define the sound of the band between Ungod and Wither Buster, Burn and Peel. He, he sort of, we came in with a bajillion ideas for Ungod, which was super confusing because we were like, a prog rock band meets an industrial band meets Depeche Mode, but I was like heavy into like Eddie Vedder at the time. So it was like all these like different directions and ideas from the five different guys in the band. And John was able to figure out the best of us and harness it and um, work with the label and with us to get, you know, a sound that was both what we wanted and what the label wanted and and it was it was very cool and then on wither he helped further define that 
And I, I thought he helped pull us in a direction that made us uniquely stab at Westward, as opposed to, I know that we got a lot of comparisons to Nine Inch Nails because of their like success at the time and the, the fact that they were sort of the quote unquote pioneers of the genre, which is ridiculous um, given all the bands that had come before them. But um, I thought John really helped on whether to find a space for us where we were, you know, with I Don't Believe and, and Crushing Me and um, other songs I can't think of off the top of my head. Oh, even Shame. Um, were, were far more like rock songs than they were industrial songs. And I thought that he really helped us sort of find a, a balance between the the sort of post-grunge rock band that we were with the still electronic kind of sound. And, and, and he, he made everyone in the band feel really good about it at the end of the day. And, and that's kind of what I was looking forward to in working with John, because um, Walter and I are in... We're actually both on the West Coast now, which is cool, but he's in Seattle and I'm in LA. So we can never sit down and talk to each other about music the way that we used to. When I was living in his guest house, he had a converted garage studio and I slept on the futon. Um, and we would write music 24 hours a day. Um, then we would sit and hash things out in a room together. But now we do it via you know email. So he'll work on a song, send it to me. I'll make some suggestions. Um, send it back and and it's it doesn't have that same sort of continuity they would have if we were sitting together and I was hoping John would help pull it together the same way that he did the first couple of records where it was just so many uh, divergent opinions he was able to like bring it together into one clarified vision um, so that's 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 what I'm hoping to get from John plus he's just a brilliant mixer so nice obviously it's premature you already finished the record ha having only oh. sort of dead and gone to work off of uh, which has got like a lot of dancey stuff in it that i also love actually cold i was like how is he still hitting these notes i don't understand uh, my, like my, my brain voice didn't compute my, vo my voice is stronger now than it was back then i have a, for sure like, but yeah. I, I have an extra five notes on my range now that i didn't have when we were touring all the time i was actually constantly destroying my voice constantly and now um that I've, I've you know took some took some time off and the dreaming toured a lot but not nearly as much as stabbing did um yeah I've, I've actually regained most of the high end of my voice um added a few couple extra notes to it um yeah so that that's that's kind of cool sorry what was your question no it's that's like kind of part of it was a partial was half a question which is a yeah i don't know how do you do this still and and as well as ever which now you know now we know and um, just be, since the Dead and Gone material seemed like a little more up-tempo and even a little dancey with the remix stuff, it, mm -hmm. is, it, is it safe to say that some of that will, factors into the new album or, you know, uh, Wasteland or no? Well, the new album's not done yet, so um, okay. it's, not, it's, it's not even close yet. We've, we've just started the mix. We, we started the mixing process a couple weeks ago, and the first couple songs I sent over, um, it was clear that they just weren't ready for John to mix them like they hadn't been developed far far enough for him so when we did when we did dead and gone I, I did 30 mixes of cold before I, and every time it, it wasn't that I changed the mix it'd be like oh I need a new guitar part oh I need to change the drum sound oh I need you know and I would basically fix the things that I would stumble across as I was mixing well John doesn't have the time to do that he's a busy guy <laughs> so if you give him a song that's three quarters done and he's going to give you a mix that sounds like a three quarters done song like oh okay so i guess the the shit in shit out kind of concept of computer coding is the same idea if we don't give him a finished idea then it's not going to come out the way we want it to sound so we he took on another project and now we're like going through each song with a fine tooth comb and like making sure that everything's just the way we, we need it to be so that when he mixes it you know, it, it comes out sounding like it should. Um, but uh, I think it's going to be a bit more like that. But um, I think it was too much of that, too much of the dancey sort of up up tempo thing. That's very much um, uh, an industrial dance kind of a sound. Everything between like 120 and 128 um, BPM. Um, and we wrote a bunch of songs that way because Stabbing Westward didn't really write that way. We, you know, we had Lies was sort of a 120 dance song. Um, 
nothing else was really um, slipping away. Um, drugstore, we didn't have that many songs that were that tempo. Um, that's the tempo that Walter likes to write at. Um, Andy wrote everything at 80 BPM. Uh, Stuart wrote everything at 104 BPM to 110 BPM. So, so the, the, the sound of Stabbing Westward was a mix of Walter's sort of prodigy ministry, uh, industrial dance, electronica kind of thing, but tapered with, um, you know, a lot of the mid-tempo, I don't want to call them ballads, but power rock kind of things that, that, that Andy would do. Um, and, and as we were doing this record, I realized, well, if we have eight songs that are between 120, 128 BPM, it's going to start to sound kind of one-dimensional with just a couple of slower songs. So we started looking at some of the songs and realizing, oh, if we approach them like a traditional Stabbing Westward song, you would just play the drum beat half the speed instead of don't ga don't ga you have don't don't ga don't don't ga which is like um you know kind of the classic stabbing us repeat and and so we're like okay there's a certain direction that we want to go in we'd like to be played on the dance floor in an industrial club you know when we go to the bars that we go to sometimes and listen to music it'd be cool to hear one of our songs um played you can't really play shame or save yourself at these clubs they're not really dance tracks but at the same time you want to make sure that it's still identifiable as a stabbing westward record so we're, we're trying to like instead of thinking of each song how can we make this song the best it can be how can we make the album the best it can be so let's let's look at all the songs as a whole and break them down so like which song would be better as a halftime groove um that's more more soulful and more uh more of a, a a, a groove feel rather than a, an, a, an aggressive dance feel. And so we started, we started that process and I think it's making for a, a much richer album experience where it's not, you know, the same thing over and over again. Is that the question? Nice. No, that was good. No, that you answered it perfectly. Um, I only have a few more of these for you and I'll give you back okay. your time. One thing actually just occurred to me right before the call, because I was like listening to my library of stabbing songs. And I was like, you know, one of the things that kind of, I think it would be interesting to get your take on is soundtracks. Soundtracks were a huge boon to the band in that uh -huh. leap from Ungod to Wither. And I, you know, I was thinking about like they were all in a row, right? Like Spawn, Escape from LA, which I love that track, the, the, the Drown, right? And uh, and then not another teen movie for the cover, right? Later on. But, uh, those, you, miss, you you missed all the missed early one? ones. You oh, missed all some of early them. Ones. The the first one was Clerks. I know, yeah, um, of course. Clerks, yeah, yeah, that was a, that was our first breakthrough, and then um, the first real soundtrack that we got that we weren't actually on the soundtrack, but we were all over the movie was Mortal Kombat. Right. We had seven songs in Mortal Kombat, seven pieces of our music in Mortal Kombat, but we were never on the actual TVT soundtrack that went cold. So it's like, oh, could have had a gold record, but um, yeah, there's that one. There's Bad Boys. It was kind of a big deal. Uh, the Faculty. Uh, Bride of oh, Chucky. Can't can't forget the Bride of Chucky. That was so um, wrong. That, yeah. I was I was I was really expecting to go to the Oscars for that one, but we didn't get to go that year. Um, <laughs> yeah, we had we had I think <clears throat> so many. Uh, what was the? There's a Keanu Reeves movie that we were in that wasn't The Matrix. The other one. It's kind of weird. How were you not in? Like, how did you get overlooked for The Matrix? I know, I know. We were in the bad version of The Matrix that Keanu Reeves did. <laughs> The oh, one no. I can't remember the name of it. Do you remember that? Oh, it was a terrible um, movie. What was that? He had remember a couple of bunkers. Yeah. I I keep feeling like chain reaction is like no on time. No, I'll I never get back. I can't remember what the name of that movie was. But yeah, we had we had a bunch of cool stuff in Ungod. I think that whoever was working at Sony during like nineteen ninety four to ninety five was just so good to the band because on god didn't really sell that many copies and if it hadn't been for all the film placements that we had gotten during that time i don't think the band could have survived and then we got a second chance we got a chance to make a second record which is rare um and and whether ended up being successful but definitely whoever was doing the film placement stuff at sony between 94 and 95 kept the band alive single-handedly because all those little film placements gave us just enough injection of money to the band but also uh hope to the label that something would come out of one of them so because so many nice. bands would do one record and then get dropped if you sold eighty thousand sure. records on columbia that's a 
failure. You know, um, that's that's why we were terrified of si signing to Columbia. We wanted our, our dream was to sign to Wax Tracks. You know, an eighty thousand would have been a huge hit, but um, yeah, and God was not a super successful record. Um, when we play songs now. It's like Walter's like, yeah, let's play nothing. It was our first single. I'm like, yeah, but no one really heard it. So is it a single? No one hears. <laughs> I don't know. It's weird. It's got quite a few uh, plays on Spotify. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 actually um, turned into a single now, just from the years of playing it and stuff. Um, right. So. Um, and then just sort of a way, a weird last question is obviously, you know, just as this, this year is a dumpster fire on fire itself. Uh, you know, obviously you're home with the family. I hope you guys have all been well. I hope Walter's family's well, everybody with the band, your peers. It's, it's just wacky between the, the coronavirus and the unrest. So I just, you know, obviously it's weird to be, you know, announcing a new record deal at this time. Luckily, I guess we're not going to see an album, maybe a single later in the year, but we're not going to see an album until next year. So hopefully things will clear up by then. And if I don't know when we're, I, I don't know when we're going to see an album. I think that there is, there, there's been much discussion with Christian about it. Um, when it's going to come out. I, I don't think it's a bad time to release an album. I think that people are home and they're looking for something to distract them. I would, I would love to get it out right now. Um, I think that'd be great. I don't, I don't think we'd be able to tour, but I don't think that in this day and age, touring is necessarily mandatory for releasing new music to people. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I hope it comes out soon just because I've been, some of these songs I've been sitting on for a couple of years and it'd be nice to, have them out of my head and into the world so it can clean up some hard disk space and write some new songs to put in there. Right. <laughs> At my age, I have to clean out the hard drive every once in a while, otherwise my brain gets too full and I can't, I can't remember. I forget my zip code. I have too many songs going on in my head. Um, that was a joke. That is a good but one. Yeah. The shelf can only hold so much. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I think that this year is actually kind of a good year. I think it's, it, it's, we're due for a reckoning of some sort. You can't just keep living the way that we've been living and pretending that everything's okay on the backs of other people. I think that the, the day of reckoning has been long overdue and hopefully we can take a good hard look at ourselves and, and try and be better. I like that. That's, that's uh, very poignant, my friend. And then just uh, a last thing is obviously last year was the, you know, the big 25th anniversary for Ungod. And then next year is another one for Wither, which is crazy to me. And wait, I'm sure to wait, you. what? What was 25 years? <laughs> what? Last year would have been 25 years for Ungod, right? 94. So, so at this point, literally every year, because we right. release <clears throat> albums two years apart, every year is either the 20th, 25th, or 30th of something. Right. So, right. <laughs> I didn't yeah, even 30... know about On God. I know that next yeah. year is the 25th of Wither, right? Right, for sure. Yeah, so that's that's the that's the <clears throat> ticket for next year. Yeah, do you think do you it, guys do will it. ever uh, do a yeah, yeah. album live? Or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's going to be the goal for next year. That's, that's why I wanted to get this one out in 2020, so that we could play some shows highlighting the new material. And then in 2021, go out and do a Wither 25. Um, yeah, that was definitely the plan. I'm, I'm way more excited to play Wither than I was Darkest Days. Oh my God, that record had way too many songs. Holy <laughs> crap. And it was so depressing. We tried to do the whole album in rehearsal and I'm like, guys, I can't do this. There's just, between, like there's just too many depressing songs in the middle of the record. It's like, people are gonna either kill themselves or leave because it's just too, that would have been a great album at 10 or 12 songs, but it's just too long. And we would get to like the goodbye and desperate now. And it's just like, oh my God, this is too much. Like we got, and yeah, so I'm looking forward to playing with her. That's a nice tight com compact. I'm not looking forward to singing. I don't believe that's really hard to sing, but the rest mm -hmm. of it I'm pretty excited about. Awesome, man. Well, you know, I like this, thing this this next era of stabbing that's still going with one foot in the past and eyes on the future it's very exciting to me having followed the band from the beginning and uh i'm excited for you and uh i hope we get through all this mess of uh this year and have a new society ready to nah. unite unite and get some new <laughs> stuff yeah probably not yeah mm -hmm. no yeah probably not. <laughs> probably not i don't think we're probably gonna not. get through this mess of this year i think it's gonna just uh yeah i don't know my, 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 my premonition is um, people are just going to get, I mean, like they're just going to get numb 
to the to the to the death toll they already kind of are mm-hmm. and the people are just going to go back to living and just sort of let the chips fall where they may just a horrible thing but it's going to be what it's going to be that's ending that's my a, <laughs> and, ending my on guess. a strong and a strong and positive <laughs> yeah. note yeah. me and chris chris man thank you for your time Take, taking it back and, to the uh, spanish flu in 1918 <laughs> that's it that's it we'll wear masks for years that's fine i'm i'm, I'm ready i'm ready hey i've got a um, bunch of cool i've got a bunch of cool like um you know industrial looking masks everyone was wearing those for, like in the 90s that's a big big thing so yeah we can make it totally fashionable again very cool right yeah if you were it's already gonna... goth you're halfway there you're already your wardrobe's ready exactly I've got all my dystopian so long... post-apocalyptic clothes ready to go lots of lots of hoods and long sleeves and, exactly uh, big, big boots down to... To the floor. yeah yeah no, I never did the I never did the Jenkos. I never I never went that route. All the guys on our crew wore those, but I, I never could never do that. Seemed like very impractical pants for a road crew. It just didn't make any sense at all. You're just constantly snagging on every mic stand you walk by. I'm like right. every time you walk by the drum kit, you drag down three symbols in a mic stand. Why would you wear pants to do that? Yeah, it never made any sense to me at all. But then again, wearing awesome. vinyl pants when you've got a super hot park can underneath your ego box it melts your your pants every time you squat down it's not the best of ideas either so the 90s were hard on fashion oh we look to a better future my friend (laughs) (laughs) Uh, good talking to you keith indeed thanks so much chris